I'm just gonna draw the, the tip of it, right? And then two, four, so out to the right, two, up four. Rough sketch here. And then next one would be three, nine, way up there. All right? And we can imagine that if you connected all these together, it would look kind of like a parabola, right? So it looked like this. Now, the other one has zero, zero as well, right? It has one, one as well. And then it has 416, yeah? Which is on this one as well. That's off my graph. My question is, does that one have 2, 4 in it? Is 2, 4 on that graph? Lauren's saying yes. What would I have to plug in? Root 2. Root 2. If I plug in root 2, what happens when you square root 2? You get 2, and then when you take root 2 to the fourth power, you should get 4. So that point is on this curve as well. And then what about the next one, 3, 9? You'd plug in on that one what? Root 3. And you'd get 3, 9. So it's not that they're steeper, it's the same curve, but they're drawing them a little bit different, aren't they? As time goes by, if you look at t as time, this one draws it, right, like that, at zero, on both curves at zero, we're here. At one, we're both here, but at two, at two, the blue one is here, and where's the other one? Way up there, isn't it? So what's happening here is that even though we have the same exact curve, even though we have the same exact curve, Even though we have the same exact curves, the rate at which they're drawn is different. So if I start the clock, watch what happens. Okay, so the one on the bottom is the one that we had over here, the table over here, and the one on the top is the one we had the table over here. They are drawing the same curve. But if you look at, the, if you look at this point as a particle or an object moving through space, there's a distinction between these two because there's, there's a speed, there's like a rate at which it's moving. Yeah? You see that? It's, it's a different concept. I mean, like if I just came into the class and I said, hey everyone, let's graph f of x equals x squared, we'd all draw a parabola, right? But with this vector function idea, we have not only a picture, but we have this idea of, of a particle moving and that if we tweak the function, we can make that particle move faster or slower, right? So if I were to sit there and let's pause this at some point here. Let's pause it right there. Okay, that's the same point in time, right? Let's look at the derivatives there. Look at, the, well, let me back it up a little bit. There we go. That's the same point in time. Do you see on this curve, we're here, we're at different points, but do you see the tangent vector? is really small, where here the tangent vector is very big. Yes? So does this add a speed? Yeah, this is, the, this is the application of what we're doing here is that, you know what, if we want to translate this idea of vector functions into like physics, then we can look at this as an object moving through space, and then the vector actually represents something, right? Um, we're, we're about to define it, and most of you know it already. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take various points on the curves and I'm going to compare their derivatives. So let me take this out of here. So this is the same, the same point on the curve. The same point, same point. Notice the difference between the, the, the derivatives. How short this is and how big this is. And I actually have the computer measuring the length here and you can see that this one is longer than that one. And then here at the same point on the curve, we have short vector, long vector, okay? So those vectors are somehow t helping me understand how fast I'm moving along this curve as t goes by. So this is the main takeaway from it, is that if r of t, 
if this vector function we're talking about represents the path of a particle or object through space, then we call it a position function, right? V of t is defined to be the derivative of that vector function. That's a new function. That is called the velocity function. And then the magnitude of that derivative is called the speed. So the length of that velocity vector is going to be the speed of the particle. And then if you take the second derivative of the position, uh, sorry, yeah, the position function, you get the acceleration function. This, in Cal 1 we learned this as well, right? We learned that if you have position, the first derivative is velocity, second is acceleration. But what's, what's different here? What's that? Well, in Cal 1, we, we start with position, right? You take derivative, you've got velocity. You take derivative, you've got acceleration. There was a big catch at the very beginning of the problem. It had to be stated in Cal 1. We were talking about linear displacement. We were talking about objects moving in straight lines. That's what we were doing in Cal 1. Every time we talked about um, position, velocity, acceleration, it was always imagining some object moving in a straight line. Now, we've, re we've removed that restriction and our object can be moving in any path through space. But if we do that, now what we have to do is make a distinction between velocity and speed, which a lot of you know from physics, right? Speed and velocity are not the same thing. Velocity is a vector that gives you a direction and a length. The length of that vector is gonna be the speed of the particle. So when you ever, whenever you have straight line motion, the velocity vector, the length of it is exactly the speed all the time. So there's no distinction when you're, when you're looking at that case in Cal 1. All right, uh, we're moving on. Integration. So in integration, you have a vector function, and we want to be able to find the antiderivative. We're going to do definite integrals. Same exact thing that we just did. We're going to do them one by one. Antiderivative of this, antiderivative of this, antiderivative of this. You can do them individually. So good news, right? So here is our first example. I've given you a vector function. The vector function is e to the t, t square root of t minus 1, natural log t. And the question, which I've taken off here, I didn't mean to do that. I wanted us to find that. So there's our vector function. I want us to find the definite integral of that vector function. Now, right now, we don't have any true meaning of what it is, all right? We're just going to do it, and then we'll, we'll talk about what it actually can become later. We know in, in Cal 1 a lot of time, I'm sorry, in Cal 2, this definite integral was like area under curve. It's going to be something for us, but just let's make sure we can do the mechanical part of it first. So if I want to take the integral, right, from 1 to e of r of t, dt, then what I'm going to do is the anti, not the anti, sorry. By the definition, I'm going to take the vector function, and I'm going to do the definite integral from 1 to e of each component function separately. So I have to do three definite integrals. When I do this, I should get a number, right? Because definite integrals return numbers. I should get a number here, I should get a number here, and I should get a number here. And that number, those three numbers, are the components of the vector. That is my answer. So the answer is a vector, yes? All right, let's do these integrals. The first integral should be straightforward, right? Everyone should be comfortable with the antiderivative e to the t. It's itself. And we're evaluating that from 1 to e, right? So nothing, nothing special here? Okay, next one. 
I need the antiderivative of this. That's not as easy, is it? That's not as straightforward. So, time out. You took Cal 2. Let's go do that over here, all right? Let's see if we remember how to integrate something like that. So, uh, this is going to be just off camera. That's just the way it's going to be. All right, integral t root t minus 1 dt. Right now, I'm going to do the, the indefinite integral, find the antiderivative. Once I find the antiderivative, I'll come back over here, plug it in, and we'll evaluate it. So, who has how they want to go about that? Okay, what u sub are you going to do? U is t minus 1. That is the correct way to go about this one. Now, there's other paths probably, but not as, not as direct as this. U is t minus 1. The derivative of that is 1 dt. Right, derivative of that with respect to t is 1. So then I can rewrite this. When I rewrite this integral, what's underneath the root becomes u, so root u. And then I still have a t dt right, to replace. dt is just what? du. And then how, what do I replace t with? Because I can't, I can't have an integral with both u and t in it. Solve that right there. For t, you get u plus 1 is t. And so this becomes u plus 1. And that should be easier to do now because we can distribute this through. And then we just have powers of u, and I can just use power rule. Let me distribute. Integral, this is u to the 3 halves plus u to the half du. Now look, I'm moving through this like you know exactly what I'm doing. If you don't know what I'm doing, this is where you take a note and you come talk to me, all right? Because I do expect you can do this, maybe not like, like it's coming off the top of your head real fast, but this is, this is trivial. This right here is like trivial stuff. I don't want to trivialize your, your struggles, okay? I'm not saying it that way, but I'm being honest. In Cal 3, we can't be like, how did you do that? You know, that's exponents, right? So now what? Antiderivative power rule on each one, so I add one to the powers. So 2 fifths u to the 5 halves plus 2 thirds u to the 3 halves plus some constant. That's my antiderivative there. And then I replace my u's with t minus 1. So I'm going to come stick that in right here. This is 2 fifths t minus 1 to the 5 over 2 plus 2 thirds t minus 1 to the 3 halves. And then I'm going to evaluate that. I don't need the plus c anymore, right? Because when we do a definite integral, you don't need the plus c. So I'm going to evaluate that from 1 to e, comma. How did you know that that was u sub? I'm just curious. Uh, did you just see it? You've just done enough of them. Good job. You've, that means you've done enough of them. Yeah. 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 So this is, I mean, this is just something like we should all know if getting through Cal 2 that it's just like, you do enough, you just start to see it. It's hard to, hard to, hard to get it without doing a lot of, of examples. All right, now we have to do another integral, the natural log of t. And don't say 1 over t, because that's the derivative of natural log, right? We want the antiderivative, right? That's the most common mistake, right? We forget like what we're trying to do. Is that what you did, Lauren? It's all right. Okay, so natural log of t, right, dt. We want the antiderivative. So, show hand, who wants this one? How do we do this one? Oh. Integration by parts. Integration by parts. Good. So look, I realize that everyone learned Cal 2, slightly different notations, slightly different methods, slightly, you know, so I know that my students will recognize what I'm doing, but in another class, you might have seen a little different. So I'm not trying to confuse you with this, but I do hope that you would be able to do the integration by parts that you're comfortable with the way that you were taught and you could get this, right? Um, I'm going to just do it the way I do it. So for me, I have my students make a table 
and we go about trying to figure out the two pieces that go in this table. What's the U and what's the DV? So for us, we only have one choice for U. It's natural log T, and that forces DV to be DT. And then I tell my students, on this table, you differentiate. To go down, you differentiate. So I'm going to take derivative of U. Deriv derivative now is 1 over T DT. And then to go up on the table, we integrate. So there's a V here. The antiderivative of DV is V. The antiderivative of 1 DT is T. And so create the table. And then once we have the table, ultra, uh, ultraviolet minus voodoo. Yeah, if you always, yes, everyone seen that? OK, so now what I do is say this is these two multiplied. So T times natural log T minus the integral, and then voodoo. This is the part that's awesome, because this and this, I need to put those together and integrate, and the t's cancel each other out, right? 1 over t times t. So all you're left with is just 1 dt, and the antiderivative of 1 is t. Well, the antiderivative of 1 with respect to t is t. So you get that, and then plus c. So that's your antiderivative. And then from there we go and we plug it in, we get rid of the C, and we evaluate the two endpoints. So T natural log T minus T evaluate 1 to E. All right, now I'll be honest, I don't really feel, feel like plugging in these values, so I'm not going to. But you can see what you need to do, right? You plug in, first you plug in E, so you get E to the E, you subtract from that E to the 1. And I would just leave it like that. And then here, this, is, this one's going to be pretty nasty. This is going to be E minus 1. All of that, e minus 1. Now, the good news is when you plug in 1, these all go away. There's zeros. Yeah. OK, the main point of this problem was just to show you, hey, remember, we need to remember u sub. We need to remember integration by parts. We need to remember basic antiderivatives, right? This stuff is going to start popping up again. All right, what about this? How are we doing on time? So what I'm giving you now is a vector function, right? It is the derivative of some other vector function. So I'm giving you the derivative, r prime of t, right? I'm giving you that. And I'm asking you, from that information, to go fig figure out the position, if we think about it as a particle, the derivative is a velocity. So I'm giving you the velocity vector. And I'm then asking you to find the position um, of the function. So I give you this. I want to know the position. So to do that, I need an antiderivative. Right? So the way I'm going to write this is this. R of t should be the antiderivative of the derivative, yeah. right? But I've given the derivative function, so by the definition, this just means I take the vector function I've been given up there, and I take the antiderivative of each of the component functions. So to figure out what r of t is, if I'm given r prime, I do the antiderivative of r prime, which means I do the antiderivative of each of the components. Boom. Notice these are indefinite integrals, right? I don't have definite integrals here. So now I need antiderivatives. So the antiderivative of t is 1 half t squared. The antiderivative of e to the t is itself. And then, oh, I'm forgetting something here. I need plus c, sorry. Here, because it's an imp um, indefinite integral, I need plus c here, don't I? Now I'm going to put plus c1 because I'm going to have three constants, one for each of these. And then here, this is e to the t plus c2. And then over here, uh-oh, to do that, integration by parts. I'll do it quickly over here.
So again, this is one of those things where I expect you can do this. I'm not, I'm gonna get to a point now where I'm not even gonna label like UDV. I'm just gonna go T E to the T DT. I differentiate down DT, I integrate up E to the T, and then I just remember ultraviolet minus integral voodoo. That's, so I'm not even labeling anything anymore. Again, I would expect you could do this using whatever method, taking whatever time you need. This becomes T E to the T minus the integral of E to the T DT, which is T E to the T minus E to the T plus my third constant. So that goes over here. Yes, you could factor out an e to the t if you want. I'm not going to. That's a personal choice. There it is. So I've got my three component functions, the antiderivatives of each one. This is, so far, this is what I know about r of t, right? It would be even better if I knew what those constants were but I actually can find the constants because I'm told that when you plug zero into this vector function, you get the vector one, one, one. So I'm going to now say, but R evaluated at zero gives me the vector one, 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 which implies that when I plug in what to this? Zero for, zero for T? Let's do zero for T in all of these. I get just C1 e to the zero is one, so one plus c2. And I plug zero in here, I get zero. e to the zero is one, so negative one plus c3. Right, that vector right there must be equal to one, one, one. And now what I do is just set this equal to one, this equal to one, this equal to one and solve for C1, C2, C3 respectively. So that implies that C1 equals one, that one plus C2 equals one, and negative one plus C3 equals one. And so I can solve for each one of these now. That implies C1 is one, C2 is zero, and C3 is two. Yes? So our constant integration is another vector? Our con wait, wait, say again? Our constant of, of integration is another vector? Exactly. You can look at the, co the constant, that C1, C2, C3, oh. you can look at it as its own constant outside, right. as being a constant vector. Exactly. Right. Yep. What was being suggested, in case you all didn't catch that, is that once you find well, maybe you can, do, you can see it right here. This right here, at this step right here, we could have written this as 1 half t squared e to the t, t e to the t minus e to the t plus some constant vector. But that constant vector would then be the vector c1, c2, C3, so that if you add those two together, you get back this line. That's what you're saying, yes? Yep, so you can look at this as being our antiderivative component functions without constant attached plus some constant vector. I did it, ju I just put the, the pieces in each one, but. All right, how are we doing? Oh, are we out? No, 10 minutes? I wanna try and get to a natural like breaking point here. All right, this is just a result here. Remember we talked about a second ago, position, derivative of velocity, derivative of that's acceleration. Well, now that we're talking about antiderivatives, that's everything backwards. If you start with acceleration, the antiderivative of acceleration is velocity. The antiderivative of velocity gives you position. Same exact thing, but backwards. So in this example, which I'm not gonna do, what I do is I give you an acceleration function, and then I give you some information about the position and velocity and I ask you to recover the position completely. So I'll let you do that on your own. And that takes us to the end of this section.
Yeah. So there was, a, there was a lot here, right? But again, we're still in the mechanics of everything right now, right? All, we're do all we've done in this chapter so far is try to understand vectors, right? N now we've talked about vector functions. We've talked about the calculus one of vector functions, the calculus two of vector functions. And we're building up to the point where we're ready to start taking everything now into different concepts like volumes and you'll see. Let me show you what the next section is. We're not going to get we're not going to get deep into it. We're going to start talking about arc length and curvature. This will be what we start with next week. I'm not going to get into it right now, but arc length, wouldn't it be nice if we had a curve in space and we could measure the length of that path? Right? That'd be nice to be able to do that. Um, one one example you could think of for this would be the problem that we did earlier, last class, at the end of last class, we did that, gosh, that was a long section. There we go. Okay, so this problem right here. Let's say we are building a pipeline, right, for gas or something like that, and we've got a bunch of junctions, and we have to hire somebody to weld these things, right? And these welders are gonna charge us by linear foot how many linear feet of welding they have to do. It would be nice if we knew the total length of those paths around each one so we could have an accurate estimate as to how much linear, like, especially if you're the welder, right? You could find the exact like, measurement and then multiply that times how many you're doing, right? So, I mean, that's not a great example, but it's just an example of you know, being able to measure the length of an arc or a path that's not easy to do normally, right? Yeah, go ahead. You can't find it integral? Yeah, because there's like a square root and nested functions inside of it. So. Oh yeah, so norm so but we can do it we can do it computationally, right? With like series. I mean we could at least if we could come up with the integral, we could go to a computer to do it for us, right? Give us a numerical answer. But we need to come up with the integral. Yeah. And that's what this next section is about, is if we have a vector function, right? Which this is the vector function right here. That's our vector function, right? If I wanted to know the length of that arc or the arc length of this path, then can we, com can we do it? And we can, so. Um, and then once we do that, we're gonna talk about something that we did not talk about in Cal 1 or 2, and it's this idea of curvature. And I think of curvature like, if you think about this path again, you know, I showed you the example where we drew the parabolas. If you were like, if that was a roller coaster that you were on, it would be a different experience for, each, for the people on each one, right? Like on one, it's not going as fast as the other one, right? And so curvature has to do with, if you're moving on a path, like how fast you're turning, your, your curve, right? The curvature, you're measuring the rapidness of change of direction. So it's different than speed, right? Speed is like how fast you're going. You have the velocity vector, which tells you, you know, Velocity vector tells you the direction you're pointing. The length of it tells you how fast you're moving. What we can't get from that information is what's going to happen in the next instant. Are you going to be now going that way? Are you going to stay in a straight line? Are you going to curve this way? Is it going to be a rapid turn, right? We would like to be able to somehow analyze the curvature at different points on the path. Yeah? And so that computation is going to be kind of nasty, really nasty in general. So. That's what we're doing, and then once we finish, whoa, once we finish this, I think we are close to, yeah, that's the end of chapter 11. I mean, sorry, chapter 10, arc length and curvature. We will be done with chapter 10, and then we begin 11. And 11 is basically gonna be everything we did in Cal 1 on surfaces. So instead of on a, on a you know, two-dimensional sheet of paper, we're going to be a surface, and we're going to be looking at tangent lines, tangent planes. Um, we're going to try and find maximums and minimums. You know, we did that. We're going to do all of that. So we get this idea of um, partial derivatives, tangent planes, chain rule, uh, finding max and mins, Lagrange multipliers. Brutal. This section is brutal. 
It's just like the algebra. It's beautiful. It's an awesome section, but it's just, it's, it's, it's a tough one. And most likely, Lagrange will not be on exam one because you see it and then you're not ready to test on it. So it'll be pushed to the final. After that, we'll be done. Spring break, come back, chapter 12. Now we get double, triple integrals. And so we start doing all the Cal 2 stuff on surfaces. And then after we finish that chapter 12, we start with vector, vector spaces in the calculus and vector spaces. Yes? Are we going to cover optimization and change? Optimization, yeah. That's what this, this right here, maximum and minimum values and Lagrange multipliers is basically what you would think of as optimization in Cal 1. Exactly. In fact, to do that, we're actually going to need to remember some of the stuff from Cal 1. All right, everyone. Um, that's it. Weekend, right? You do have a test that's due two weeks from today. You're not supposed to work. Is it today? Next. It's due next week? Oh, it was two weeks from when I handed it to you. No? That's not. Is that right? It's due a week from today? Yeah, no, we can't. There's there's eight or nine of these. We're gonna run out of, run out of time. You've had you've had um, everything you need to do that test for a while. So do not procrastinate on these tests. It'll catch up to you at some point. All right. Get, let me stop recording and then we can talk.